Hello and welcome to the Animation Communication Podcast, your source for discussion about animation, film, fandom, and more. So please, join your host, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, or KP, and Lauren Kizich, the Abbey Roadie, for today's discussion. If you like what you hear, please remember to support by giving a like, a follow, as well as subscribing to the main I Love Kim Possible A Lot channel on YouTube. Spread the word, and keep being a part of a great community. This episode is appropriate for all ages. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Animation Communication. If my math is right, which it usually isn't because art people are bad at math (laughs) in general, then we had a no fun podcast last week. So this week is back to fun time podcast and specifically doing having a person in here that we haven't had for a medium that we haven't really talked about because we talk about mostly like cartoons and things that you watch with your eyeballs but not things that you touch with your hands yeah it's fine (laughs) this is fine okay naz do you want to introduce yourself then yeah my name's naz i'm a full-time plush maker from queensland australia so i hope my accent's not too thick for all of you guys listening but yeah i've been making plushies full-time for about eight years and that's my thing Nice. Yeah, and, and if for those for those who have who have been living under a rock and have not seen Naz's amazing work, follow follow Naz on Twitter at at NazFX, right? Is yeah, it's at N- so. NazFX Studios. So N A Z F X yes. underscore underscore Studios. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, we're very very excited to have Naz on. I've I've been following your work for for a number of years now, so it's been really cool to see just how far your design you just keep getting better and better with your designs they only keep like no. like my jaw hits the floor every time so <laughs> it's just thank you i appreciate it yeah it's it's changed a lot over the course of those eight years <laughs> yeah and i guess to to start things off i mean this is you know we want to make sure that oh, for Lauren, those who can don't I say know a you, thing oh huh? no, for just oh, yeah. general uh no news this week because there's not really a lot of news stuff going on right now so. I, I i can't i can say at least for for little blurbs arlo the alligator boy comes out this friday at least as of, as of this episode on netflix so go watch that when it comes out because it looks really good and the music's really nice so and then i guess as of today I'm now aware that there's going to be a Godzilla anime being released on Netflix as well. So look for that. <laughs> oh, okay, I lied. There's um, some news, but like only like three seconds. But, but it. it's like little just <laughs> brief, update, brief updates. I guess there's one more. It's a sad thing, though, is that Arclight and Pacific Theaters just announced today that they are closing all of their theaters. And just when we're coming out of the pandemic, they're doing this. So... That kind of bums me out a little bit, but we're, I promise we're going to pick this up at this, <laughs> with the, what we're talking about today. So, but those are the very, very quick headlines as of today. So. Okay. You can, you can ask the questions, Lauren, the scheduled program. Yeah. And now for something completely different. So Naz, now you said you've been professionally making plushies for eight years, but when, how, and when did you start officially like making plushies like what was your what was your starting point i started making mlp plushes as i'm sure a lot of you guys are aware i started maybe in gosh it would have been 2012 and then i started doing it i was at university so i finished university in 2013 and then from then onwards have been doing it professionally so i I sort of started like a lot of plush makers did making the mlp plush and then it just grew from there <laughs> exponentially. So, who is your favorite pony? Rarity is the best pony. <laughs> there you go. That's a good. Answer. Is that a good opinion? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done a Discord before? <laughs> oh, no, out could... of curiosity. No, I haven't. He's really complicated. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I was just curious. <laughs> yeah. No, I never, never had anyone ask me to make him. To be surprisingly, so. Oh, okay. Well, I can ask you to make him, but like shipping from Australia would probably be like crazy lots of money that i don't have right now but yeah yeah one year at bernie con they had a life-size discord that some dude was carrying around it was like taller than him it was crazy anyway That's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and and for and for all the plushie makers that go to the to the pony cons and make the plushes you guys are doing the lord's work because uh, you make plushies so much better than the the mainstream manufactured stuff that it's just like I, I I bow I bow to you and your skills. It's just <laughs> you guys are doing amazing amazing work. I'm I'm always in awe at every convention I go to. Yeah, yeah they, a lot, um... lot more patience than I'd have. So I'm just like just just super <laughs> it. It's fine. So 
That's why I don't make plushies. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so so you started with MLP plushies. So what what inspired you to start making plushies in particular? Um pretty much I just saw other plushie makers making MLP plush and they were too expensive for me to afford, so I decided to make them <laughs> myself. <laughs> That's the mood. I'll make That's my own mood. plushies with yeah. with blackjack. Um <laughs> let me let me backtrack and explain for those people who not who do not horse and are not horses. I hope we don't have any actual horses listening to the podcast. That'd be confusing. No anyway, so we have in the in the horse community we have official Hasbro plushies that have always kind of sucked. Not so bad. Like there's there's exceptions to that rule. I think the four the four D E ones or whatever are like pretty decent. But especially when the show was new, like there was not a lot. And there's those stringy hair ones. I don't know what company like Fun mm-hmm. Size or something like that, which look creepy and scary. So a lot of people, especially people who wanted characters that maybe weren't part of the toy sets or like even newer characters when the show was airing would like there's like this little plushie maker community where they hand make the plushies and then they sell them online and that's how a lot of people even get their OCs. And they are typically expensive. Naz, what would you say, like not you specifically, but what do you Mm -hmm. think is the general price range for custom made plushies for pony stuff? For just a generic pony, I would say like probably the average price is probably starting at 300 US dollars and then going anywhere up to sort of 800 US dollars depending on what pony but it depends on the artist like it varies yeah. greatly so. yeah. yeah yeah and some and some some creators actually they'll rank it based on they'll they'll price them based on a pose too and for by size by pose by like I would like I have a a beanie plush of my of my OC who I think I think she was about like a little over 200 and she's a beanie plush and she's like, I absolutely love her. And, and yeah, so, but it does depend on the maker. It's like, oh, for a sitting pose, it's this much for a standing pose. It's this much. If you want fully posable, then that's a whole other thing. So yeah, cause there's some, there will be like the fully posable plushies that may have armatures or something in them. Yeah. So yeah, it does depend on the maker. It also depends on materials. So there you go. Yeah. And yeah. if you're concerned, then yeah, I've seen like when, when you're in the con scene and they're selling them professionally, then they can get really expensive depending on also the rarity of the, the, the plushie or if it's like there's something like like a meme from the season, like like or a specific pony, like what's the Daybreaker was a was a mock off of the of a character called Princess Glacia and like there are only a couple daybreakers because it's a relatively rare like character and it's a new character and you know sh- she's a meme or whatever or like not a meme maybe like just popular in general so yeah they'll run expensive and if you think thronies are crazy then yeah you're right they have a lot of sometimes they have a lot of disposable <laughs> income and you know for the bigger cons i will get little kps commissioned and then sell them to sometimes but anyway that's the general market I guess from what I've seen, but I'll let it go back to Naz because I'm just like a plebeian, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that's you know just specifically for MLP plush. Like I, I make all sorts of plush now, so there's all different markets. So MLP yeah, that's is just fair. Mm-hmm. One. What are what are some of, of the uh, other markets? Because I have no idea about those. There's a lot of different fandoms, obviously, that people make a heap of plushies for. So Undertale was massive when when mm-hmm. that was big. Owl House has been one that's been pretty popular lately. The market that I mostly target towards is furries at the moment. So uh, I make a lot of first owner plushies. That's sort of another market like like the bronies. There's a lot of rich furries out there, questionably rich furries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I do have. I. I now. I. I do wonder. Given you said Owl House, you have you gotten hoodie requests? I don't know if you guys are aware, but I don't really make uh, copyrighted plush anymore. That's a big change. Oh, that, nice. Um, yeah. Oh, really? So that was a big, big decision for me. So I think you know, it's probably been a year or so since I stopped doing that. But that was just something that. Yeah, for my own peace of mind, I decided to do. Not not a lot of plushie makers do make that decision, but that was just a, a weight off my mind. Yeah, I was gonna say. I recall, if I'm recalling correctly, you did a Unikitty, like a life size Unikitty plush. Didn't yeah, you? I did a couple of commissions for a guy that he was the creator of Unikitty. So he works yeah. at Lego. So yeah, he commissioned me for a fair few of the characters from the show. So I'm happy to That's make awesome. um, you know 
named sort of copyrighted characters if it's you know through legal means so yeah, yeah. no that's understandable yeah it's <laughs> you don't want to get in for any any trouble for that kind of stuff especially when it's like everything you do is so carefully crafted yeah yeah oh i have a i have and, a follow-up uh, question when more mm-hmm. is oh, yeah. oh my follow-up no, no no you go ahead oh my follow-up question is correct me if i'm wrong but i think one of your unikitties made a cameo in the background of lego movie 2 in the live action yeah it did that was really cool uh yeah she was in um, <laughs> one of the live action scenes when they're in the little girl's bedroom originally she was meant to be on the little girl's bed but i was told that uh, she was taking too much attention away from the actress oh uh, what a what a <laughs> Upsta- yeah. upstaging the human actress i love it <laughs> so uh, she's on the floor in the bedroom but she's still there so That's there you go cool. there's your there's your claim to frame congratulations it is <laughs> You officially have your mark in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where's my movie credit? Now, I, <laughs> now I, yeah, I was going to say, because then when you started making plushies, how did they, how did you, I guess, how did you start getting, gaining an audience? Like, I know it's when you kind of hop onto the pony train. Yeah. It is, it is pretty easy. Like, once you start trying to make a name for yourself and you have something unique to bring, mm-hmm. which you do with your plushies is that you start getting a lot of attention. So how, it, what was, I guess, how did you start gaining that audience? Uh, it was pretty much just choo-choo on the pony train to start with. It was it was quite easy to get <laughs> an audience back when, especially in the early days of MLP, when there weren't as many plush makers. There's probably ten, yeah. tenfold now of uh, what there was originally. There was only a small handful of people starting out. So I think it definitely helped to be, you know, have my foot in there early. But yeah, I just, you know, tried to make better and better quality and you'd get your name out there, you know, within the brony fandom at least. And and it just sort of grew from there. And you'd make a popular pony that, as KP said, had just come out in a recent episode and then it would get shared everywhere because everyone was obsessing about, you know, what the latest pony was and things like that. Right. Back in the day. Yeah, especially. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, especially with how lightning fast I see some plushes get made, like literally overnight, or sometimes depending on like the the level of detail. Yeah, sometimes even same day. They know <laughs> what they're like, doing. On... <laughs> I'm like, you guys are like, whoa. <laughs> it was uh, almost a race back then, to, because yeah. obviously whoever put it out first would get the most attention. So yeah, it was sometimes right. a matter of like seeing the episode immediately, you know, getting to work and. And some people could get them done overnight. It would usually take me a few days. But even then, you'd still get a lot of attention for them. So what was your first viral pony then? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. (laughs) I remember, like, even the first pony I made, I made a rarity and put her up for auction. And I think she sold for, like, $900, which for me back then was, like, holy crap. So I was very excited about that. Whole tub of money party there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was a huge amount of money. So that was, I, I what other ones went? I made. I think I was the first person to make one of the crystal ponies. So I airbrushed like a crystal texture mm. on one of them. Nice. Uh, that went pretty well. Yeah, I made some flutter bats, and flutter bat was always really popular. So, but yeah, I felt you know a lot of them went pretty viral as far as ponies go. Yeah, I never really got the the flutter bat. Is it just because she's like like. Is it like a sexy thing or I don't know? I was going to say, is that all right to say on this podcast? But yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. It's, I mean, well, I think, yeah, one, Fluttershy is already a popular character. So yeah. when you give her almost like that, the the bat alter ego, yeah, it, it, it complete change of, of personality, then yeah, it's very enticing for, for people who, who especially who, who love fluttershy already mm-hmm. and she just she just has a very big fan base so they're gonna be like i i'm a simple person i see fluttershy yeah. i like or I, <laughs> I throw money at it <laughs> so but yeah so yeah <laughs> that's that yeah pretty much <laughs> i was gonna say because you over time yeah like you said you started focusing more on like original creations and less on copyrighted characters that also comes with uh you running like your patreon and stuff like how did you come up with the idea of doing like monthly patterns like sewing patterns and plush patterns for your patreon uh i started patreon 
I think it's something like five or six years ago now and doing the monthly patterns was only something that I've done within the last couple of years so it's a bit more of a recent development. When I started Patreon I was sort of just doing generic plush making tutorial like every two to four weeks and then Mm -hmm. at one point I have I think I've made like 120 tutorials so at one point I was like I have run out of like generic plush topic to cover so that's when I started doing you know every month we pick a creature the patrons vote for that and then I pretty much make a tutorial on how I develop the pattern and how to put it together and and people get the pattern as well. So that was just a really easy way for me to continue making content where it didn't rely on, you know, having a new single technique to focus on every single month. So I pretty much have a near unlimited pool of like creatures and, and magical creatures and things like that. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and it's cool because, again, like having Patreon be the thing where it's like the engine for people to vote through saying what they what they want. Because, yeah, again, it is also kind of like depending on what it is, it pushes you outside your comfort zone in other in other areas and allows you to go like, now I can do that. That's cool. I figured that out. Like, <laughs> Yeah, massively. And a lot of it is like every month I try not to cover the same things over and over again. So I'm constantly looking for like different techniques that I can try and teach people. And I think it's like a completely different ball game. It challenges you in a different way to look at something from a teaching perspective, uh, not mm-hmm. just from making the thing. It's uh, what techniques can I use to make this different and provide a learning experience? Okay, follow-up question. It's it's not on our questions, but I'm going to ask it. Mm-hmm. So like, could you like break down how, like for people who don't know how they how to make plushies or just assume like oh they're just they're chinese people make them or not you know like china produces a lot of things that's not a, yeah like yeah. anyway um i'm not racist but anyway <laughs> so how do you so i guess it would just be like cutting out specific pr- patterns and trying to build it in the 3d 3d space or can you just walk us through that yeah it's i don't know how much you know about how sewing patterns work but if you imagine like a t-shirt is made of the front of the t-shirt and the back of the t-shirt and you know if you laid them flat they would be a certain shape plushies are like that Mm -hmm. it's all flat shapes that are then sewn together as you said to create a 3d shape it's something that i taught myself you know over those eight years that i've been doing this and Personally, I draft it all in Photoshop because I like doing it digitally because I can just edit things quicker, you know, mesh things together, scale them, skew them, rotate them, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'll I'll usually get reference images of the character that I'm making a plushie of. I'll draw out certain shapes based on, you know, the the forms that I want to create for them, print that out, transfer that to Minky Fabric, which is the fabric that I like to use. And then I sew that all together uh, and stuff it and then see what kind of shape uh, that 2D pattern has produced. And uh, if it's a pattern that I haven't made before, sometimes I'll have to remake elements of that pattern, you know, making little tweaks uh, to the 2D version, then testing that in 3D. And sometimes it can, you know, I might test a pattern up to a dozen times, like remaking wow. that plushie. So it's one thing people don't realize when you're wanting something fully custom. Yeah, it can be, it's very, very labor intensive. You're not just making the finished plush. It's a lot of development goes into the pattern. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's all about construction and making sure the thing works, you know, at the mm. end. So it's like, again, like what somebody could request something and it'd be like, I want it like this. But then you have to think, okay, well, this thing has to stand. So if it's like this, you can't, you have to be be able to figure out how to make it something that'll stand, even if it's not like how somebody specifically said, oh, I want it to stand, you know, looking like this reference. But in Mm. order to get, if they want a standing plush, you have to figure out, okay, I got to make sure that this thing is able to stand properly or it's weighted or it's like balanced. Because God only knows, I know I have like even just like, figurines where they're so top heavy and then the, the like you suddenly realize if you take them off a stand you're like oh that's why they're on a stand it's because yeah. <laughs> they have yeah. no other means of staying upright so yeah it's a lot of figuring that kind of stuff out too huh yeah a lot of the uh, 2d designs that i work with you have to work out how they can actually make sense in 3d and you know you get like chibi characters or even uh, mm-hmm. i hate to be harping on mlp so much but you think of like the princess ponies their oh, legs God. are like mm-hmm. Their legs are like super, super tall and wafer thin. 
and then their bodies are, you know, reasonably like you sized. Stuff. Yeah, so you have to do a fair bit of uh, engineering work to actually get that to stand up using, like, steel wire and stuff like that to wow. get them to hold their own weight, so... Mm, don't 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 forget the yeah the manes mm. and tails and all that kind of stuff if you're trying to get them to beha- behave a certain way especially if you're trying to make something for movie or show accurate depending on what the the property is or yeah it's just like trying to make that again like you said translate into 3d space and you go like well this is a, it works in a cartoon but it doesn't exactly yeah. mean it's going to work in real when, life. when you think of it being a weighted thing in, mm. in real life yeah yeah, I've made a couple of big dragons, like from the Spyro series. I don't know if you remember, like there was the, not the latest Spyro, but the one before that, and they had like the adult dragons, the mentors, mm-hmm. and yeah, their body, um, their wings are like, you know, I think the plushie was maybe eighteen inches tall, and then the wings were like three foot long, like Whoa, yeah, it was ridiculous. Oh God. Like, so yeah, it does get quite crazy if you're working with sort of uh, realistic proportions, if you know, trying to translate them into real life. Okay, I have a, I have a yeah. boring question, potentially. Like, mm-hmm. how complicated is, is it to ship all this stuff when you're, like, shipping things to America as well? You know, like, when you have mm-hmm. all those different parts to think of. Like, I'm not sure how Australian custom works and all that stuff, but, like, could you walk uh, me thankfully, that? Thankfully, it's not too hard. I haven't really had too much trouble with it. Um, it's really just finding a box big enough to put them in. <laughs> uh, the good thing about plushies is... They're not uh, super breakable. It's not like you're sending like a you know, piece of sculpture that's made out of clay that can snap. Like it's all soft yeah. material. So as long as um, like I'll bag them in plastic to make sure that they don't get water damaged, for example. But yeah, mm. they're not liable to break in the way that you might think. So they're quite robust for posting. Yeah, I was trying to remember... Now, um, again, I remember seeing it happen on, on Twitter and being posted and shared on Twitter, but I was trying to remember if it was you, if it was somebody else, what happened with like a particular, I think, I guess maybe one concern of shipping would probably be like what happened to an Appleton plush. Yeah, I, don't know I know what was, you're talking about. That it's was, not me, but I do know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but I was wondering, I was going to ask if you'd seen that that story because I remember seeing it was like spliced down his tummy. I'm like, oh, yeah. no. Thankfully, it's never happened to me. I've probably only seen cases of that happen like maybe three times in like the eight years that I've been doing this. So it is something that can happen, but it's very, very unlikely. I feel very sorry for the people that it does happen to. Yeah, especially when it's just like, look, I understand security measures, but I'm like, guys, it's you. You, you run it through like yeah. an X-ray, and you could see it's an apple type. <laughs> it is the most innocent thing you could have in in a box. It's <laughs> did, like did customs like like kill these kill these plushies is that what happened yeah i'd like cut yeah, them pretty down much the middle it. to see what's inside oh they like spliced open the box and they sliced open a custom custom made appleton pokemon plush so yeah it was supposed to be a life-size one too so it was big so that's like a big thing to a big thing to lose and a big thing to try and replace so Oof, did did do they still send those out even after they cut them up like how does how does that even work? Uh, I, I don't, it depends on who makes the plush and I don't know how they worked around that. I can't remember. I just remember it was, it was a huge upset that I, I remember seeing a ton of people talking about because yeah, it's again, it's like literally you could just scan this thing and it's just like, if you run it, I'm not saying it's as simple as running it through an x-ray, but I mean, even then it's like, it's, it's a plush, it's a plush toy. Yeah. You know, that'd be a lot of but, like know, crack yeah. if someone was trying to like smuggle like drugs or something through a through a, through a Pokemon plush. <laughs> Apple drug. <laughs> that's the, that's the street Apple name, crack. you know. <laughs> Apple crack. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, I was gonna say I, you kind of talked about like yeah the constructive the construction of that of your plushes. What do you? What has been your most ambitious? plush to date or maybe even just a few of them what were some of the more difficult ones that you've put together um the one that i'd mentioned just before i made ignitus was the dragon from spyro he was like the the Mm -hmm. father figure big fiery dragon dude he was very hard just because the wings were so massive what are some other complicated ones 
I wouldn't really call it a plush, but it was kind of plush adjacent. I made a life-size Crash Bandicoot, which was about five foot tall. Mm, that's uh, right. Yeah, and that, that nearly murdered me. That was a really <laughs> difficult project. Um, oh, but it looked fantastic at the end. I know yeah. I remember. It was just like, oh, wow. I, I was, I made, again, like probably like everybody else, jaw was on the floor. <laughs> I made a, a fatal error. I accidentally, because I finished him, and it had been several months that I'd been working on him, and, and I'd taken the photos. And I was like, I just want it to be over. I just want to post the photos. And I made the horrible, <laughs> horrible mistake of posting him on April Fool's Day. Oh, no. So, yeah, the reach was real bad. So I, I have many regrets. Never post art on <laughs> April Fool's Day. Yeah, like number one date to avoid at all costs, even on social media. Because yeah. that's like, the, the, I go in and I just like, I'm like, I don't trust any of you. Yeah. <laughs> A bunch of people probably thought it was like photoshopped or something like that. But... But yeah, I've made like a uh, big Pokemon, like I made a big, big Charizard. Uh, I made a, a huge mm-hmm. for alligator, which I, I use for a lot of uh, promo photos. I think he was like three foot tall or something, but he was quite epic. That was another challenging one. But yeah, I've made a bunch over the years. This this sort of, you know, a lot of challenging ones and it's just, you know, which one's the next one. So. And and also I've seen it's kind of a more recent development in 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 what you've been able to create because you've been able to utilize your your experience in in plushy construction and and whatnot is that I've been seeing you de- delve into uh, like fursuit pieces yeah so yeah. Like you and that's that was more within like the past couple years or so right yeah I'd say probably within the last two or three years I've sort of uh, dipped my toe into making fursuits but. I really enjoy it. It's sort of very similar skill sets involved. FYI, I love Taro. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is absolutely adorable design. So it's like the moment the moment I saw Taro as a plush, and then I was just thinking, just like, oh, if it, it goes into fursuit territory, then we're just on cloud nine, and it happens. So. That was another case that- of like, I want a thing, so I'll just learn to make it myself. <laughs> <laughs> And you did an incredible job. Thank you. So, and and I know you've been doing even more like like realistic animal animal pieces as mm-hmm. well. You've been doing like eagle heads and whatnot. So, again, yeah, again, like you said, this was more like I, this is something I want, but I'm going to learn how to. I'm going to teach myself how to do it. How, how I I should say, how, how many people have like commissioned you for fur suits or partial fur suits or anything like that? Uh, I've only just started taking commissions for them. I opened up recently and took on a couple of partials. I've been a little bit chicken with opening up for commissions for them, you know, just because mm. it's something new. And while I have a lot of experience with crafting, you know, I haven't made a whole bunch of fur suits. But yeah, that's just something that I'm starting out with. So I'm taking on my first uh, couple of official commissions as we speak. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm sure it was everybody was won over by Taro and going, yeah. <laughs> going like, I want this. <laughs> but yeah, I like the first yeah. suits. It's uh, a little bit more free with, you know, using different mediums. With plushies, it's kind of like you, you use fabric and, and paint and that's about it. But with fursuits, there's a lot of different sort of mediums that can go into it. So. What are the materials that you use more for like, because especially when you think of like head construction, because a lot of materials go into those. Like if you have something like taro or what's like the materials you'd use for like a beak or teeth or anything like that? Yeah, I a few years ago got into 3D printing, which has really changed my life. It's been Mm. really fantastic. So uh, (laughs) a a lot of things like that 3D printed, like the eyes, the beak, the claws and stuff like that. So that's great. Yeah, I really like that. And then you just like smooth them out. Is that how you, is that how it works? I'm just trying yeah, because yeah. I I find 3D printing so fascinating, and so to see like the finished product, I'm like, do you like kind of like file it down when it comes out? And yeah, there's a lot of sanding kind of thing. involved to uh, mm. to get them like really really smooth, and and using pro- different primers to fill in like the little print lines and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and then like you just paint them and and seal them with whatever you would want to seal your paint with. That's great. Yeah. So I like uh, being challenged with sort of different art mediums and not just sticking with the same thing all the time. So I like to dip my toes in different things. Yeah, I just... Have you considered... Go ahead, Lauren. Oh, no, you go. Oh, I was just thinking, like, I'm just quiet listening to the background, but, like, I imagine fursuits can just be really complicated depending on, you know, the subject. Like, if they want, like, 
the jaw to open and, mm. and move while they talk, or if they want, like, the thing to blink and, you know, light up eyes and the whole, like, first scoots scare me. Like, they, they can, they, they seem like a mess. <laughs> it can be, yeah, it can be extremely complicated. <laughs> and, it, and it's like, with my persona that I made the fursuit of Taro, I had to choose, like, the extremely heavy striped character <laughs> yeah, for my first one, which was torture, but I kind of like torturing myself with artistic projects. That's a bit of a theme. <laughs> but yeah, you, know, you can have a character with like a million polka dots and stripes and rainbow colours and anything you can yeah, imagine. It's, it's, it's like when I think about, I guess it's because when I, when I look at things as being design because i look at things from like an animation perspective mm-hmm. of saying like if you, you try your best not to use like a million different colors on a character because you, you have to know that down the line somebody's gonna have to color that character yeah, and they're yeah. gonna have to do that for a frame after frame after frame after frame unless you <laughs> jinx so it's it like... and you, you make it a puppet built animation mm-hmm. and they just lose stuff but anyway <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah, and then again, that it it depends. Plus, you just throw all that out the window if you make a three D model, and it's just all there. But <laughs> but but yeah, it it's I, I love seeing Taro being adapted. And yeah, I know it, it probably was killer to do the stripes, yeah. but <laughs> but it turned out really well. And actually, you know, the stripes given they could have been like like you said, like a million different colors. It could have been a lot worse. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> It, it wasn't too bad in the end. It's just a lot more legwork. I think it, as a yeah. sort of, you know, appreciating animation. And in the end, it's a big flex. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, compared to artists that just do still drawings, I think animators could relate, you know, because you are uh, laboriously going over every single marking and detail if you're doing like 2D hand-drawn oh my God. animation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So while it might take, like, the concept artist one second to add another stripe to that tiger, that's easy for them. But then, you know, the animator has to animate that stripe 50 million times or I have to laboriously mm-hmm. sew in every single stripe. So I think we, we share that suffering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's why it's always so try to make it sim- simple yet complex. Mm. Like, it's trying to find that balance where it's like, Again, where you had something like, oh, here's a bunch of gradients. Like, MLP was able to make it work, but yeah. only be- after, like, trial and error. Because because as the as the show went on, the puppets were able to evolve. Mm-hmm. And the tech, tech for them was able to evolve a little bit, too, and update. So it was able to keep track of that a lot easier compared to where they started. But yeah, that's like that's like a whole other thing. I just remember when I, when I got my, when I was going to get my, my beanie plush done. And I remember I was, they were like, oh, oh yeah, where's a reference for your pony? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's here. And I'm like, she's literally like brown on brown on brown. So they're like, oh, this will be easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, Lauren, to and be so fair, like, you do have a relatively easy, and it's an earth pony too. Like, it's pretty Yeah, easy. Yeah, so this is like an earth colored earth pony. It's like very easy. It's just this a coffee colored pony. But <laughs> yeah, people but, love yeah, that. It, yeah, because she looked at me like, "Don't worry, I people come I to me this. with like gradients, so they're yeah. like, you're good." <laughs> it's always nice. Like I do this. I we we sell the sometimes we sell the KP plushies for charity too. So like the bigger ones, I'll either sell for charity or or not, depending. And it's like we do turnarounds for the the puppet people because. Like, on paper, it might look kind of easy, but, like, the stripes can get really complicated sometimes, mm. especially, like, the yeah. stripe mm-hmm. in the end, where it's, like, or the tail, where it's, like, is it the whole, like, cowlick or part of it? Anyway, it's boring stuff. But, yeah, KP Pony can be a little complicated sometimes when we make her, but I, I have never kept one of mine, one of the KP Ponies. I always, like, sell them for something one way or the other, so there's a couple, like, floating around the internet. Anyway, it's not about me. But what other questions are there, Lauren? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, kind of going back into like the into the fursuit territory, are there like uh, are there parts of of I guess you say parts of building a fursuit that you, you haven't tried yet? You've been itching to try though. After you've seen like probably like I like I remember going to conventions and even if they weren't like 
fursuiter conventions fursuiters mm-hmm. would show up and they would and they would immediately flex like all the cool things about their suits and i'd be like in awe it would be i think the first convention i ever went to was anime expo years ago and there was a guy who showed up in a dragon fursuit yeah and he's like I, I said i love your suit he's like wait hold on you gotta see this and he because he was gonna pose for me for pictures yep. and he spread out these huge wings That's and i'm like flex. <gasps> I, I have a story too for a cool cosplay when you guys are we're done. Yeah. But let Na- what's your let Naz answer first, and then we'll jump back to me. Yeah. I recently did something that I've been wanting to do for ages that has been an aspiration of mine. I don't know if any of you guys saw the sort of realistic cat head that I did recently. Mm-hmm. I did blink yes. blinking uh, eyes on that one, so that's nice. something that mm-hmm. I've wanted to do for ages. It's not sort of done very often in fursuits because it's something that requires a lot of tweaking and it's not really suitable for just the everyday person to wear casually Mm -hmm. you sort of need someone that can uh, fix it if something breaks and there's a lot of sort of parts that can break but yeah I, I did the bleaking eyes on that cat and I sort of wanting to move closer into that like animatronics realm I'm currently teaching myself to use Arduino so like little micro programmers I wanting to mm. learn to yeah do more sort of complex animatronics is sort of where my career aspirations are, are going at the moment aside from the plush making yeah that sounds interesting yeah. Yeah, the, the the art side is like easy for me to understand, but the ele- electronic side, my brain is does not compute. Yeah, yeah. I feel my brain uh, would just shut down. I'm just like that's mm. too much math for me. Yeah. I, I can draw a circle. So, <laughs> have you consulted with like other fursuit makers who delve into the like the mechanics of that kind of stuff and had? Like, um, there's not or... really many fursuit makers that have. There's a couple of people that have done blinking mechanisms but it's very very minimal Mm -hmm. some of those people have gotten other people to make the blinking mechanisms for them and then they just install them into their creation but yeah i have i've talked to a couple of people about it that have uh, given me feedback and helped me a bit but it's not not something that there's a lot of resources out there on how to do yeah i I was gonna say because there's also like yeah kind of like what we touched on earlier there's like screens and stuff like you know like when you have like screen eyes or mm. or even like there's there was a, a one suitor i know i've seen the masks circulating on my feed every now and then it's like almost like a daft punk esque yeah kind of head where it's like the whole face is a screen really and so the eyes and then like the jaw like the little teeth like uh, it was almost like canine teeth would show up but they're digitized I guess depending on what inspires you or who or whose character you might work with if you're doing like uh, suit commissions would you consider like teaching yourself doing screen stuff or would you probably ask for somebody else for help with that kind of stuff yeah that's probably a bit outside my wheelhouse that's um there's actually a whole species of that are what you're thinking of that have uh, they're called protogens and they have like that, that digitized go. sort of like kind of like a, a vintage like there used to be toys that looked like that like little robo dogs and things <laughs> yeah uh, in the 90s yeah. and 2000s they kind of remind me of that like but, like the poochies and yeah and, and, ro- and, and there was another one yeah there's poochie and then there was the dog that kind of responded to your like your ipod oh that that yeah because <laughs> <laughs> now no doubt nowadays is like iphone yes ipod what's that yeah um <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, but, uh, a very niche thing. Uh, there's only a couple of people that make those because it's just so in depth. That's way way beyond me. I guess <laughs> sort of my personal aspirations is to do more like animatronic, like uh, practical effects with like like the cat's face that I did recently. That was all silicone with the fur glued on top. So the you know the flesh mm. sort of you know, flesh is not a good word, but uh, it sort of uh, <laughs> moves with the like machinery underneath it. So. That's more what I'd like to do, having that sort of realistic creature with those mechanisms underneath rather than doing, like you said, like Daft Punk kind of yeah. inspired stuff. That's not really what I would like to go towards and I don't think I would be able to do that sort of thing <laughs> in any way. Yeah, I, I, I see you as more like you go to more like the organic forms, mm-hmm. which is totally cool because it's making things more believable and more yeah and that's just uh, my jam you know, like i'm good at realism yeah. and and i sort of envy people that are really good at drawing like uh 
you know, cartoony sort of stuff. I'm not very good at that. I'm good at uh, <laughs> interpreting things that I see rather than you know, creating concepts from scratch. So, yeah, it, I think it's yeah, it's it's really it's it's almost like a, with the direction that you go, it's almost like going down the route of like Jim Henson's creature. Yeah, creature yeah, exactly shop that sort of thing. That kind of thing inspires where... me a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love I. I know I've gone through many days where I've disappeared down the Stan Winston rabbit hole and yeah. just like watch nothing but but animatronic building and seeing how like even if it's like movie monsters that absolutely terrified me, <laughs> it's 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 it helps to look at them being made as animatronics because I, if anything it just fascinates me because you're like mm. this is what makes them so believable is people taking all this time to be able to make these things as convincing as possible and part a huge part of that is yes one that they're physical yeah. props and they're physically there for the actor to interact with but it's also seeing like people studying like engineering and then they're also studying biology and just observing how life works and how physics work mm. it's, it's very of, very complicated yeah. and like there's usually whole teams doing it there's so many mm -hmm. different sort of niches that go into it yeah, when you think about like, like for something like the alien queen from Aliens, that's like the xenomorph queen, and you had to think of like like fifty people, yeah, puppeteering her because it was like an animatronic, and then I think you had like an actor inside the suit at the same time, mm. and they're all having to like lift her like a crane off the ground, <laughs> so just as she's like this, this spider like creature that has to elevate herself above. Yep. high above the cast so it's like it's insane but i i admire it so much and it kind of just roots back into what you do making making not only plushies but also now making fursuits and that kind of stuff and making them as believable and convincing as possible that's why it's like when i see your like the realistic animal heads like it's just amazing the how much detail Thank is you. in them yeah that, that's my favorite <laughs> thing to do i don't get you know i have to pry myself away from plush making but if I could do that full time I would be very happy <laughs> <laughs> who knows you'll find yourself maybe as a as the next Jim Henson's creature shop yeah I'd love kinda, to do that like... sort of thing <laughs> because it is it basically is is like it's an inventor's playground mm. more or less is being able to like make these things how do these things work and how do we make them as believable and convincing as possible yeah um uh, yeah, so it, I, I I admire those skills so much. It's like something where I, I absolutely adore puppetry, mm -hmm. so and and animatronics and seeing all that being done. So it's it's almost like like if I had the know how, I would like I I'm always willing to learn. But I always like thought it would be so cool to to learn how to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm not an engineer, but it but to do the creative stuff to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, math is evil. <laughs> Yeah, the electronic um, side is definitely scary for me, but I'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, that tends to be the case, especially when we're all coming from from areas of just not that's not our wheelhouse. Mm. But we, but but if it's something we're like, well, if we want to make this thing work, uh, we we got to try something. Got to got to figure something out. Something. <laughs> yeah, it's I I think it's like yeah, I love seeing suits that'll do things outside of the norm, like seeing like a jaw movement or eye bl like again like your eye blinking. And sometimes even like for, you know, when you see like eyebrow furrowing or or yeah. upper lip snarling like on like a werewolf kind of like suit thing. It's just I've seen some of those and I'm like, "Ah, oh, jeez." Seeing the mechanics of it work before the even the furs lay on, you're just like, "Holy cow." Yeah. So yeah, neat, what a fool me. But like living. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah, did you have any? Did you have any other uh, questions, KP? That, no, I'm just like other... adding stupid jokes because you guys are having a good conversation. <laughs> and I just feel like okay, I'm here, just chilling, playing with my Play-Doh, wanting to contribute positively <laughs> to the conversation, but in a way that's unintrusive. So. <laughs> No, it's all good. It's all good. I guess it like we you we kind of touched on it a, a few minutes ago was saying like if I could do more of, of certain things. So I guess I could touch on it and we could talk about it maybe even a little bit more as a where do you see your business growing even more in the future? At the moment, my Patreon is doing super super well, so I intend on nice. riding that wave for as long as it uh, exists. Uh, so Patreon <laughs> probably good. takes up about half of my time at the moment. 
and then the other half I can you know, choose to take, you know, taking fursuit commissions at the moment or I can take on more plushy commissions or if I have the funds, I can work on personal stuff, which is obviously my favourite thing to do, like most, <laughs> ar- like most artists, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, so I guess I keep I intend to keep doing Patreon and, you know, I, I never intend to, like, quit plushy making or quit this or that. It's always a skill that oh, I yeah, no. have. But yeah, if I could do more of the like realistic creature work, that would make me very happy. So we'll just have to see. It's the hard thing about it is finding customers that have wallets big enough to fund <laughs> doing these huge projects for them. Uh, whereas the plushies are a bit more accessible for more people, but like not yeah. a lot of people, yeah. not a lot of people can uh, afford to pay like my wage for like three months or something like that. If you know what I mean. Um, I was gonna say because I've seen I've seen some other people do and they're not as common but I've seen them as a thing is like pet when people do like a pet plush commissions mm -hmm. where you know they all take a plush they wanted like a plush commission of their pet either as like an homage to them or something they wanted a doppelganger Mm -hmm. or that it's a tribute to their pet or that passed passed on or anything yeah yeah, have you gotten any like have you gotten any commissions or requests for those kinds of commissions because the, those do feed into like the realistic mm. animal kind of realm. I I do get them a lot, but I don't know how to say this without sounding harsh, but a lot of the times <laughs> those people don't have much don't they want to spend that much money. So mm. a lot of the time they just want something that's representative of like I guess the spirit of their their pet that's maybe passed away so they might go out and get a Mm. simple plush um it's not a lot a lot of the time that people will want to spend like thousands of dollars to get a replica of their their like their pet made so yeah I don't really do that very often so no no that's no I get that yeah but yeah it did it, it, it was something I had thought about where it's just like you know, I'm like, it is, it is along the realism thing. And I know I'd seen other plushy people do them mm-hmm. or they'll do, or even just in general, like people who do pet portraits or yeah. anything like that. Like I've seen some of like those, like, what do you call it? Like the, like felt, like little felt yeah, sculptures felt. of pets and stuff. Yeah. Needle felt. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend that she makes really amazing, realistic life-size wolves. And that's a lot of, uh, you know, she, that takes wow. up a lot of her time, but they're huge. Like. You don't really realize how big a wolf is until like you've got a life size version sitting next to you. But um, I think I know which one you're talking about. What What's the name of the artist who does those? Because I swear uh, I've seen Yellow the life size wolves. Yellow Freak is yeah. the name she goes by. Yeah, she's really really talented. So yeah, because I know I swear I've seen them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I, I I love seeing like life size plush versions of things, and I think it's again kind of like when I think about when I was a kid and I would see, you know, I would go into like an FAO Schwartz or something. They would have like life-size mm. plush animals in the store. Like when you say, I want the life-size giraffe, yeah. please. Uh, <laughs> I think like, uh, I've seen, yeah. I can't remember her name. There's like a YouTuber and she went and bought um, like a life-size spider. Oh, like not a oh, life-size that's Jenny. Aragog. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember. Oh my gosh, an Aragog? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's the only reason that I know that store because we don't have them in Australia, but I, I can visualize uh, what you're talking about because of her video. Yeah, it, and... And it's a shame that they, they don't exist anymore. Oh. But but at the time, the the they 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 were around for a long time, and and they were known to have like some of the best. Like if you were to think of like I guess you could say main I, I guess more or less mainstream plushies because mm-hmm. they were a major brand. So major brand plushies they were some of the like the best that you could get. Yeah. Uh, and they're definitely worth the they were they were worth the money. I remember I I think I only ever bought myself like one. FAO Schwartz and I think it was like after I'd like started my first yeah maybe it was around the time I I started my first job where I'd had like my first job as like a even if it was like a little like a little painting gig to help family or whatnot mm-hmm. it was like uh, I wanted to buy my very first and very well my not my very first but my first to buy with my own money an FAO Schwartz mm-hmm. plushie and it was a tiger big oh, beautiful big Bengal tiger tigers. yeah 
Yeah, I'm like, I was going to say, because, like, Taro's got the tiger stripes, yeah. too. Uh, <laughs> gorgeous. And, yeah, it was, like, it was, like, one of those things that felt like a rite of passage to, like, get up, to be able to say, I bought myself a toy, and it was an F.A.O. Schwartz. Yeah, I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an adult at 14. Anyway. <laughs> but, but it was... Yeah, it, I always love like, a very well-crafted plush. And then when I got into the convention scene and seeing people make these incredible plushies and go just like, man, you took FAO shorts and you just like, FAO yeah. shorts walk so you guys could run. This yeah. was like, <laughs> like and, and, and not just run, just take off to space. You guys were just like absolutely phenomenal. Like it, just because it wasn't a ma- mass manufactured thing, there was mm. time and care and, very high attention to detail. So yeah, I will always love a well-crafted plush, no matter how old I get. And that's yeah. the, I think that's one of the best things about plushes. You don't have to be any age to, yeah, you can be any age and enjoy them. So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's bamboozling to a lot of people that you know I don't obviously don't sell to children. They find that very confusing. It's, it's a lot of collectors. But... <laughs> It's like, well, yeah, you have to consider, like, it's it's once you get, to, like, a very specially made plush, it's mm-hmm. like, uh, you got to take care of it. And if you're giving it to somebody too young, there's this, they yeah. don't know how to properly take care of it. It's a, like you said, like, there is, like, airbrushing and that, that kind of stuff mm. that you can't roughhouse with something like that. So it's it's meant to be something that is enjoyed carefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I can't odd. imagine any, like, 12-year-old walking around with, like, 600 bucks to drop on a plushie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you saying? Yeah. I forgot hmm? what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, okay. Keep going. All good. <laughs> no, I don't know. I was going to talk about my my cool my cool cosplay I saw. Yeah, uh, yeah. That one time. Okay, so the coolest cosplay that I ever seen is I'll probably find you guys footage of it if you want to on the YouTubes or whatever. But someone, this was when I went to uh, Phoenix Fan Fusion before the, the plague happened. And someone mm-hmm. was in a full, full-size like T-Rex co- costume, Ooh, with, yeah. and someone else had was like walking in on a chain, and it huh. like oh it roared and it blinked <laughs> and it like moved its neck, and I wow. was just like, "What the hell?" So that, that makes was... me think of that makes me think of you have the Walking with Dinosaurs show. That's yeah, what it makes yeah. me think of was. Uh, because I know, actually, I do remember that the Walking with Dinosaurs Arena show, like the company I made, it was actually based out of Australia. Oh. And they ended up later making the, they ended up later making a How to Train Your Dragon Arena show. I went so and it was saw the same that. people that worked on the dinosaurs. Huh? I went and saw that one. I, I know what you're talking about. The, <gasps> you did? Yeah, yeah. It was a long How was it? It was pretty amazing. It was a, a while ago now. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, it was one of those things where I remember watching video and just being enamored. Mm-hmm. I mean, even just by the dinosaur one, when it was the walking with dinosaur thing, I was like, oh, if this ever comes to my town, if this ever comes to my town, yeah. I want to go to see the dinosaurs. I just, <laughs> just like, you just revert to like child, three version. years old. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I want to see dinosaur, the dinosaur, mom. I, I mean, I was born, it born the same year as born the same year as Jurassic Park. So I feel like that says something. Uh, <laughs> um, and but yeah, it was the yeah, seeing the dragon show adapted to with it when they said, oh, we took basically the foundation of walking with dinosaurs and we took our experience from that and we built mm-hmm. dragons out of it. So we made the flying dragons and we did, you know, the the gronkle that can blow uh, blow smoke rings and stuff. I'm like, oh, it blows smoke rings. <laughs> That's all I wanted for Christmas, Mom. Yeah, I like. Can I just get a dinosaur or a dragon? That that'd be cool. Thanks. <laughs> you got to make it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're from scratch. I would. Mm. That that's a whole. That's another thing. Because I mean, there's fur suits, and then there's like I guess you could say like a uh, scale suits. I I, mm-hmm. I I wonder if that's the term. Have you considered going into like the scaly territory? <laughs> With that sort of thing, I guess it depends on how uh, elaborate you want to go but you know the there's like silicone casting and latex and things like that but uh, i think most fairies don't have the budget for that kind of thing like I, you know if you're making that for a film it would be like tens of thousands of dollars like if not hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. for a suit that was all you know you have to get your whole body cast and then they would sculpt the scales on top and uh, all that sort of thing so it's a, a bit more complicated than uh, 
is practical for a lot of commissions, I think. But there are um, yeah. people that make like dragons, dragon fursuits and, and things like that out of like cast resin and stuff. But it just depends on how complicated yeah. you want to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I do have one more question here and we can, and if you have any other KP, just have them ready. Okay. Um, I guess because we do like to ask anybody that comes on here because they, to impart wisdom upon the youngins yeah. in the audience, whatever youngins are, are listening, uh, I guess, or just people who want to pursue uh, different crafts. Mm-hmm. As a, what advice do you have for those who want to pursue like plush craft or fursuit building? I thought about this actually a little bit earlier. I was wondering if you were going to ask it or not. But my <laughs> suggestion would be don't get into these sort of artistic fields unless you love doing it because it's not necessarily a very financially secure career choice. <laughs> so don't go into yeah. it thinking that you're going to make big bucks, but oh, I don't actually, you know, it's a, a slog. I don't really like sewing or I don't like doing this or that do it for the love first and then the money second because if you want to do it for the money first like this is not the career for you (laughs) (laughs) extreme amount of patience as i can yeah imagine yeah yeah if you don't love it then it's a lot of suffering for not a huge uh, (laughs) financial gain so yeah i think people just see the numbers and the price people pay for these things and they don't really understand the work they that goes into them as well as like the work to get good to do the thing that you're doing too yeah mm-hmm. so that's a whole other thing yeah it's like that and that goes into the whole argument of people thinking they oh we can we can haggle and, and get you to to lower the price down to do this thing for me and it's like no have you considered that all of this has been calculated based off of skill set mm. skill level how many years you've been doing it, how many years of training it took to get to this point, how many, how many freaking, uh, you know, how much I've spent on materials to get to have this ready, mm. you know, and yeah, it's, uh, it all adds up. And, and it's just like, no, you can't exactly haggle that when you have something that's custom made yeah. and is, and is trying to meet very specific requirements. Yeah, people just see uh, like the huge price points on like fursuits and plush and things like that, and they have no concept at all of the time that goes into it. You know, like some someone might be charging five hundred dollars for a plush, but it might take them like several weeks to make, and then it's like, are they really mm-hmm. earning like big bucks? Like you think they are? If you like, you know, compare that to them working like a, a normal job where they're earning X amount per hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on top of that, you have to think about other people who might be queued up and, and who are also commissioning the same person. And you have to think of the time that they're they're having to allot th- for those people as well. Mm. But you're not they're not the first in line. There may be other people there who are already waiting for theirs to be done. Mm. So you have to have patience for that too, because like I'm I'm willing to wait for however long it is for anything to be for any any piece to be done. If I'm especially when if I'm like I really love this artist or I really love this this plushy maker and I'm like I know that their end quality end quality product it's just going to be top tier yeah. so I just know I'm like give them the time and 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 let them do their thing and trust them with the process then it's like I know it's going to be fine yeah. so I think even then with like my beanie plush I ordered it at the last BronyCon which was August 2019 and I got it in January of 2020 yeah but it was so worth the wait and plus the the, the artist was able to make uh it's Cassie's plush by the way oh yeah, uh, yeah Cassie's they, really nice uh, <laughs> yeah she's she's great she and she actually has the queue set up so you can actually see what process or what what stage in the process your your plushie is being yeah. done in so that actually is really nice because then that's almost like more or less it's communication without having to communicate saying like okay by the way I did move it into the next stage but if you want to see where it moves from there, you can keep your eye on there. I'm just going to keep moving it along as I keep you know, working on it and just, just keep your eye peeled on it. Like, okay. So, <laughs> and so it's, it's, it, I, I, good art takes time, just like anything. It, it's something of high quality is going to take time. Yeah. So have patience for that as well. And I think like, you know, set your expectations. Like if you don't want to wait too long, try and find someone that has uh, a shorter queue and, and just keep an eye <laughs> out for like how long a queue they're maintaining and are they working through mm-hmm. that properly and yeah, obviously cover yourself in that respect. But yeah, mm-hmm. some people will have longer waiting times than others. I try and keep a really short one. I made the mistake of 
taking sort of longer cues earlier when I was starting out taking commissions. I'd take like a year's worth at one time. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And that was like really like crushing. So I've, mm. I never will do that again. I, I sort of keep, <laughs> keep a cue of like maximum like two months maybe. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It, and it's scary doing that because you want to have that backup of orders, you know, knowing that that money is going to come through. So having yeah. a shorter queue is a little bit scarier because you don't have that absolute guarantee. But it's much better for everyone's mental health, I think, <laughs> if you have a bit of a shorter oh, yeah. queue. You don't oh, get yeah. I never happen. forget the mental health of the creators involved mm-hmm. because plus for, for some people, it's like they may have a day job on top of that. So yeah. it's like yeah. it's, it's if they're trying to do this as their thing on the side, you got to consider that, yeah, they aren't working on this 24 hours a day. Mm. They're going to be trying to fit this in where they can because they're trying to supplement. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely sort of uh, have realistic expectations. But mm-hmm. yeah, do your research. And I... Uh, yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any more questions because I think we already covered them. But if you did, you have any points? <laughs> any other points of discussion, or did you did you want to like talk about anything else before we end? Oh, I'm trying to give me a second to think. Yeah, no, no worries, no, no problem. worries. Um, so, Lauren, how's the weather? <laughs> Decent. <laughs> <laughs> what states are you guys in? I'm in California. Yeah, I am not. Yeah, I. I was in California, but then the plague happened, so I'm waiting to okay. plague out. So yeah, yeah. Have you guys got but, vaccinated yet? Uh, I have. I don't think Lauren has. I th- you're uh, scheduled. I'm though, queued right? up. I'm scheduled for Thursday, Yay. so I get mine on Thursday. Yee. Oh, I'm happy for you guys. Yeah, thank you. How's How's Australia handling like the stuff? Yeah, we're faring a lot better than you guys in cases, but our <laughs> quarantine like chances look very dim for a while it's it's been interesting because the quarantine i'm oh, sorry not the quarantine the the vaccines are being uh prioritized for countries with uh, higher covid rates and because we mm. have lower covid rates it's yeah it's really hard for us to get vaccines so i don't reckon it'll be till next year that we get vaccinated which wow is a bummer. man yeah. so Dang we kind it, of we have responsible like, yeah we have like the opposite problem so like we have you know less cases but then our vaccines are crap but you guys have had more cases but you're doing really well with the vaccines so yeah yeah california has been slow on the roll but mm-hmm. at least i'm finally getting around it where it's like finally people like uh, within my age group are able to get them if they're not uh first responders and we get them this week starting Excellent. this week so so good <laughs> where would you get started in in the process of building a plush I would personally you know, recommend, you don't even have to get a sewing machine to start out, but I would highly recommend it just because hand sewing is going to make everything take like 20 times as long. <laughs> uh, so, mm-hmm. so if you can start out by you know, saving up for and buying just a very basic sewing machine, you, know, you just need something that can do a straight stitch. Uh, try not to get something that's like one of those gimmicky like learn to sew kids first sewing machine like oh, yeah. really no no pretty no crap like even if you get <laughs> something second hand it'll just really speed things up but there's a lot of really good free sewing patterns out there so i would definitely recommend checking out online i never know how to pronounce her name it's choly knight or coley knight it's c-h-o-l-y and then knight like a knight in shining armor sort of thing i think but she has lots of really amazing free patterns and then you know, you can start off with those and get an, a general idea of how to just put the pieces together. And I started off by doing that. And then you go, oh, this shape plus this shape equals circle. Yay. <laughs> and then, then you can combine those shapes together to just make more and more complex things. But also, like, I have a heap of tutorials on how to draft your own patterns if you're interested in that sort of deal. Shameless plug. But uh... <laughs> if you have the money... <laughs> You can yeah. do it to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's you know plenty of stuff online for you to check out. There's also lots of free tutorials if you've uh, got the Googling abilities. So that's what I, I hope recommend. most people do, you know, like if you'd be surprised. Have access to the- <laughs> that's that's fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also I get a lot of people asking, do I need an embroidery machine? And, 
that stops a lot of people from getting into making plushies because they think that they need one and they're quite expensive but you definitely don't need one I don't know do you guys do links in the bottom of your talks like yeah yeah we can we have that ability yeah I have a a big document that I wrote on like how to get into plush making it's like a a a free guide sort of thing so I talk yeah yeah alternatives to using a embroidery machine for people that don't have one so yeah that's great yeah definitely so check the link in the description if you're listening to it on youtube i don't know how anything else i don't know how we do links in like soundcloud or whatever so like just go there (laughs) just go there you can come to my page and i'll like boop it down there somewhere (laughs) but yeah uh, no problem Um, i guess uh, what would be the next step in the process of like uh oh i I I guess it's a bunch of construction Oh, you have one? Oh, okay. question. So I don't know what an embroidery machine is compared yep. to like a regular like Do you stitching know, machine. Um, so you, if you've like had most plushies will have like the eyes that are sort of like lots of little stitches ah, of the thread. That's, yeah, yeah, there's a machine that does that. So. Okay. Yeah. And you also need software to like turn, it's like you turn vector images into like the file. Oh, that the machine okay. Reads, that makes sense. So. That, mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, I that's I figured that's how pony eyes would were, were work. But, like, even, like, when you get custom key marks and mm. stuff, I imagine it can be complicated if you don't have something that's just, like, doing it automatically. Yeah, it's, it's definitely more work. There's, like, more complicated and less complicated ways of doing it. But you can do it with, you know, sort of different techniques, but the similar result to get eyes and cutie marks and, and all that sort of stuff on a regular sewing machine. So Okay, interesting. Well, now mm. I know that's the thing. The yeah, more you know. Lear- learning. <laughs> what were you going to say, Laura? Before we cut you off. Oh, yeah, no, I was going to say because you have the, yeah, basically putting things together and, and, and having the proper materials and the machinery. What would be the next step after that? Like, how do you figure out maybe, well, I mean, I guess piecing everything together once you have things kind of constructed. And uh, I guess, yeah, I guess you can say kind of like what putting in eyes or anything like that or even down to airbrushing describe your process from that point yeah there's so many things that you can learn it's kind of like saying how do you start to learn to draw like (laughs) you can hand someone a pencil but then like you know there's different programs and you know different shading techniques and different you know da 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 but you know just start out simple you know you can start to learn to draft your own patterns if that floats your boat there's plush makers out there that purely make a living off sewing other people's patterns so you don't necessarily have to learn yourself even though that's something that I would really recommend because then you can you know develop your own style and customize things Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more deeply but you know just start off simple and then pick one thing to learn at a time and then set your mind to that you might want to learn airbrushing so you know, the way that I learned was I just would go and watch a crap ton of YouTube videos, you know, how to airbrush, <laughs> and, you know, 50 videos later, then, you know, you might save enough funds for taking on a couple of commissions, and then you use those funds to buy a basic airbrush, and then you can go from there for more complex things. But, you know, don't expect yourself to be able to do all of those things when you're starting out. It's sort of things that you pick up over time, uh, one at yeah. a time or slowly, so... Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of paints would you even use for airbrushing when it comes to that kind of stuff? It has to be something that kind of you yeah, know, can you, stay there. Uh, you can use all sorts of paints, but I personally recommend, this is very specific, but the Golden brand acrylic, there's the, what are they called? High flow acrylics. They're one of the very few paints. A lot of fursuit makers use them as well because most airbrush paints, mm. if they come into contact with water, they'll just wash out. But go- yeah. golden paints, paints are the one of the few ones that will actually resist being washed. So that's nice. my personal recommendation. That's good. So, yeah. That's my tip oh, for airbrushing. Question. Yeah. Um, how do you wash plushies then? Because that can be, sounds like it can be complicated. Yeah. yeah, don't put them in the washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> I if imagine they're... like you have a death wish if you're like, let me just put this yeah, pretty much. thing in the washing machine. <laughs> Like, you know, if it's just a, a mass-produced plush, like, do whatever you want with that. They're made to, you know, 
to handle rougher stuff, but yeah, just like spot cleaning only with the plushies. I personally, you know, not everyone will have this, but there's like those little wet dry vacuums that like squirt the water out Mm. and then they suck it up. I have one of those. Yeah, so it's almost like it's like a like a Hoover. Doesn't Hoover make those kinds of things? I guess they they make like a wet dry vacuum. Yeah, it's yeah for stuff like like that. Got a small for spot treatment. Yeah, it's kind of like a carpet cleaner sort of thing. Um, Yeah. But yeah, I would definitely recommend like testing out whatever soap you're using on like an area that you don't care about too much, like just in case there's like a nasty reaction or anything like that. But you know, if, if you don't have something like that, I just get like a mildly damp rag and just like dab at it with some like, you know, don't use hot water, um, don't use any heat mm-hmm. because obviously uh, a lot of these fabrics are just polyester, they're plastic. So if you use heat, it's going to like melt the fibers of the material so don't use any heat you also don't want to yeah. fully submerge them because uh if the whole plushie gets damp on the inside it doesn't dry very easily so if you get like you know if you stick your whole plushie underwater then maybe you'll have oh. some residual like wetness like left over on the inside which is not a good time so yeah just uh, you know using as little water as possible but i would just get like a sponge and like brush in the direction of the minky fibers with a sponge yeah but yeah it depends on like you know what stain you get on it and like if you get red wine or something i would you're pray, you're just like having you. wine like <laughs> yeah. with your plushie by yourself you got like a like your five thousand dollar plushie next to you and like sipping wine <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I would I, certainly hope you're not the type of person to just sit there and be like, oh, yeah. I, I, I can just casually lean against my life-size, yeah. my life-size $10,000 plush giraffe yeah. and just like have a <laughs> glass of wine I want to be that it. person. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, the advice is like, try not to get it dirty in the first place. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know that, yeah, if you keep, if, if, keep, keep it in a good place where it's going to be as far away from that kind of mess as possible. Yeah. And if it depends on, you know, if you want to have, you know, sleep with the plushie every night and snuggle it, the unfortunate thing is like people are sweaty and uh. it's going to build up <laughs> mm-hmm. over time. And yeah, if you want to keep your plushie pristine, like I would just recommend like cuddle it sometimes, but don't sleep with it because it's inevitably going to get a bit festy. So <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, that's how, it, yeah. On how you mark the done. yours. It's just full of your sweat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I assume that most people don't uh, cuddle mine too much when they're like paying such big bucks for them. But yeah, it's what you spend your money on. They can do whatever they want. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. true. I, I don't have any more questions. I think we had a pretty thorough conversation. Lauren, do you have any Good. questions? Yeah. yeah, I think I... I... I think I had them all answered, actually. Awesome. Good stuff. Naz, do you have any questions for us? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think I should be pretty good. Okay, okay. So I guess we'll do our ending plug. So where can people find you again if they want to stalk you? If you want to stalk me, you can find me most places at nazfx underscore studios. So that's N-A-Z-F-X underscore studios. And that's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon. If you want to come and learn how to make plushies, I do tutorials on it every month at my Patreon. So come and check it out. Give me your money. (laughs) So if you're new to the podcast, we're just like episode 50 something, yay. (laughs) <laughs> please please pay attention main channel like you suck right now so like make sure your <laughs> notifications are on and you're consuming all the things let's see and you're subscribed obviously and then if you like the podcast usually comes out on wednesdays at 6 p.m 6 a.m there you go 6 a.m for the 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 sound the podca- Spotify for, for the ones, streaming streaming and then ones, yeah 4 p.m for the youtube version which is the same thing but it just has a loopy background on it um, it's on yeah, so it's got some got some nice art to it. So art. there you go. <laughs> um, and then well, well, go ahead. Lauren. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, thank you so much, Naz, for joining us tonight, or at least this afternoon where you are. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, nice no. to finally talk to you. It's always nice when when people follow me that are actually talented too. Not that people aren't talented, <laughs> but but you know what I mean. <laughs> Not not the plebs. 
yeah How dare, especially please. when i've been <laughs> especially when i've been following your work for a while and it and so it's really cool to to meet the to meet the person behind the amazing plushies and i just i, I i'm so excited to see where you continue going from this point because i mean it's only up from oh. there because it's <laughs> it's i absolutely love your work thanks guys <laughs> Yeah, it always looks, it always trips me out because it looks like you like photoshopped a 3D model in there and I'm just like, no, it's a plush. What? Yeah, that's my favorite, <laughs> co- my favorite comment ever. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> I think it's especially when it comes down to like, uh, yeah, when you had something like a, like as painstaking as it was, like when mm. you did the, the life size crash bandicoot, like I, that, I was like, man, you'd see this like sitting at a studio in in like the hallways as something that would be representative of the brand you know so it's like this is some like high quality like professional level like and also model accurate to (laughs) that is just like it was uh, unbelievable so i mean the attention to detail so it it this isn't to, this isn't ego stroking. This is being I was going to say because my, I'm like my ego I'm genuinely, appreciates this very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm ju- I just genuinely really love and appreciate you know that the craft and and care that goes into making things like this. Yeah, Lauren's the the the, the optimistic to my cynical like she's the good cop. The bad <laughs> yeah. cop so I'm just like I'm, I, I'm a I'm a hype girl. I guess you could say. <laughs> You need to edit your avatars so, like, KP has little devil horns. <laughs> or has a little angel. <laughs> Ew, people are gross. And then she's like, people are so talented. I'm like, no, Lauren. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> but she is talented, though. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, 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 you filled her head enough, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll do me for a while. <laughs> Yeah, you know, she can just float to America on her on her big head at this point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we did all the things. So thanks for listening to this episode of The Thing, and we hope to see you in more if you're new. If not, you can catch up if you did all of that. Good job. You have a lot of free time, yo. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, so everyone. Anyway, good bye. night, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Animation Communication on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider. We are really hoping this show makes a difference in how people view animation and media, as well as giving and providing advice for people all over the world who like or want to join the animation or media industry. If you liked what you heard, please remember to subscribe and rate those five stars, as well as tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to our main YouTube channel, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, and turn those notifications on. My name is Scribbler, and you have been listening to Animation Communication.